things of the world, all these things I'm going to put into my tool chest. And those are then, some of you are motivated. You're motivated to learn new things, to grab a hold of new experiences, to walk out and to conquer that world. But some of you may end up feeling a little unsettled. Isn't this changing a little too fast? Where is this going? Where do I fit into this world? And you are in good company. Because every time there's a major change in the world, people are unsettled. In the 1700s, with the first Industrial Revolution, the world changed in a way that had never changed before. Everybody left the farm and they went into the factory. Cities began to be born and the world fundamentally changed. And in that environment, there were voices that cried out. There were voices that say, let's hush this cry of forward till 10,000 years have gone. Alfred Lord Tennyson. Let's stop. Then there are other voices that says you can never change things by fighting the existing reality. Those that conquer are those that step out and those that grab a hold of this new future and those that step ahead. Then you fast forward a couple hundred years to the second industrial revolution. A revolution that again changed the world. This is a revolution that gave us the automobile, the airplane, the electrification of the world. And again, the voices came. There were voices that said, we have to run away. Can I leave the city? Can I sit by a pond in order to discover myself? Those of you who have read Thoreau. Then there are other voices like Ayn Rand that said it's the men who throughout the centuries look to the future and grab a hold of their destiny. They're the ones that survive, and they're the ones that rule. We are standing today in the middle of a new revolution. This is a revolution of information. This is a revolution driven by technology, where every one of you have in your hand or in your pocket the ability to connect with every other person in the world, have access to all the information in the world. Believe it or not, this is the third major revolution of our time. And change is in the air. So the question is, what voices are you going to listen to? The question, the voices that want to go and sit by the pond, or the voices that say, I'm going to grab hold of this future and run to it. Now, this changes around the world. If you take a look at the 10 biggest economies around the world, five have had major changes in their political system over the last year, where the incumbents were thrown out, or there was a radical change in the political parties. There's radical changes in the way the finance is working. The last three years, they have been over $3 trillion per year spent in global mergers and acquisitions. In 2017, it was $4.7 trillion. Much of this money used to flow out of the Western nations. Now it is coming out of the East. We take a look at changes in the medical world. So scientists came up with an algorithm. They said, if we can take a look at your medical data, ask a few questions about you, we can predict with over 85% accuracy whether or not you will have Alzheimer's in your old age. Now, for those of us who life planning, that is a fantastic piece of information to have. Daunting, but fantastic. In the hands of your insurance company, it's threatening. Researchers were able to enter into an embryo pre-birth and actually change the genetic makeup of the embryo that would have given it a heart defect that had been born, and they fixed it before it was born. Change is happening. Change is moving quick. But it's not just the science. The demographics are changing as well. So we have this new generation coming through, the millennials. We've heard about them. We know that some of them still are living in your basement. But this generation is different because it's large. When we look at all the new home buyers, all the people who are buying homes today, 42% of them are millennials. So this millennial generation is starting to buy homes. But this generation looks different than the other one did. And so we have a major change in the racial makeup of the millennial generation. We see almost half of this current generation are non-white. You go back to the baby boomer generation, which was the first big generation that had an impact on housing, 71% of it was white. You look at Gen X, my generation, 62% of it was white. And now we look at it's almost balanced. 
and it's in the, uh, in the makeup of that. And we see a large part of this actually coming from the Hispanic population. Think about this. If you took the U.S. Latino population, this is U.S. Latino population, and you segregated them as a GDP, the buying power of the U.S. Latino population, they would be the seventh largest GDP in the world. They would have more buying power than India, Italy, Brazil, or Canada. And that population are buying homes. We take a look at the last few years, we see 60% of the rise in household formation is coming out of the Latino population for that. So this is where the money is, this is where the new homes are being purchased. But not only is this generation looking different, they're actually acting different. And we see this in our own lives. Our consumer habits are changing. The way that we shop is changing. It has an impact on real estate. In fact, at Zillow, we did a very small thing. We stopped calling it searching for a house, and we started calling it shopping for a house. Because that is the mental capacity. That's how people approach the shopping experience. They do it like they do all the other kinds of shopping. Search is something you do on Google. Shopping is something that you do that's personal. And look at the way that shopping has changed. We have Amazon Prime now in 45 different cities and growing every year. What do you do? You go on and order something, and within an hour or two, some 20 guy in a bicycle drops it off on your doorstep. It's wonderful. It's actually quicker than hopping in the car and going and getting it yourself. If you do want to go get it yourself, you go to Amazon Go. You walk in the store, grab a bunch of stuff off the shelf, you walk out. There is no cash register. There is no checkout experience. It knows who you are. It knows what you took. It knows your credit card. It simply takes care of it. Then we have online grocery shopping. 30% of the millennial generation say that they buy some or most of their groceries online. Now, they, do they do it because it's cheaper? No. no. They actually know that 20, it's about 25% more expensive to buy stuff online than it is to go to the store. But why do they do it? Because it's convenience. So what do we take away from that? That they're willing to pay for convenience if you can shave time off a clunky process, closing, People will pay money for that experience. This has, has having a profound impact on brands. So Toys R Us, Babies R Us is a chapter 11. Probably will not survive a year. Brands that we have grown up with, like Sears, JCPenney, and Macy's, probably will not exist. Retailers are trying to figure out how you connect with this new generation. So if you high-end retailers of furniture, you know, uh, Restoration Hardware and West Elm, they said, if people aren't coming to the malls, if people aren't coming to our stores, how are we going to sell them our furniture? So they said, let's have an idea. So they're buying boutique hotels, and they're actually outfitting the entire hotel with their furniture. So if you stay in the hotel, you sit on their furniture, you sleep in their furniture, their sheets are in their furniture, and at the checkout desk, you can buy that furniture and then have it shipped to your house. They realize, hey, how do people experience our stuff, not go and shop for our stuff? And that is the wave of the future. Now, in your neck of the woods, because this is actually in Beverly Hills, Nordstrom's, is saying, how do we embrace this new, uh, new wave? They're doing Nordstrom Global. How many of you have heard of it? Yeah. You go in there, there aren't any clothes. There is a wine bar, and there's an espresso machine, and they'll serve you that. And you sit there, and you look through the clothes. What do you do? You make an appointment for later that day or later that week, and then they have all the clothes ready for you. You try on what you like. You take what they, they you don't like. They send back to the warehouse. A whole different experience in that. And so we have today's home shopper, who is in all of the experiences of their life, having new and different experiences. They have immediacy, they have transparency, they have convenience, and they have beautiful touch points with everything they do. Is this going to impact what you do? Yes, it will, because you have to be in line with this, or you will miss this next generation. And of course, technology is driving this. Technology is what's behind it. Of course, it's my phone that goes off. <laughs> it is my wife, and apparently I do have her set on emergency contact, so it will break through. But, emergency, but it, technology is changing. Now, when you think of artificial intelligence, most of you do not think of art. So there was an interesting experiment. So they took all of the Rembrandts, 
and they gave it to a computer that was self-learning. And they said to the computer, study everything about these Rembrandts and try to figure out what's unique about a Rembrandt. And then what did they ask the computer to do? They said, can you paint a Rembrandt? And what did the computer do? It spit out a picture that if you look at that, you will say, if you know art, well, if you knew art, you'd probably be at the barista and not here. Uh, but if you knew art, you would say, that is a Rembrandt. But that is completely unique, created out of whole cloth by a self-learning computer. Things are getting smart. In fact, it's scaring people. Over half the people surveyed said the pace of technology is too quick. And kind of like Thoreau, I kind of want to get out and sit by my pond. And even more people said, I'm actually scared of technology, not because it's going too fast, but because I think it will actually make me obsolete. I am worried about my job. But we have a different view of technology, because we believe that technology enables the consumer to drive new demands. That same new te technology can help you meet those consumer demands. And we think that there is a fantastic business in actually keeping the agents in the middle of the transaction but providing, providing them with technology that allows them to respond to that consumer in the way that they want to do it. So how are we doing this? Well, sometimes it's very simple ways. So we know that there are shoppers who are interested in shopping in Chinese or shopping in Spanish. And so we have a site called realestate.com. It's one of our brands. It's a smaller one. It's one that we play around with. And so we have it in Spanish. We have it in Chinese uh, for that. And we also have it in millennial. Because millennials, millennials speak a single dollar amount because they come out of the rental space. And so when they say, how much does it cost me to live a month? It costs me $2,000. And it's a big surprise, and you know this if you've sold a house to them, when they realize it's not just the mortgage, there's also the, the the taxes, and there's the insurance, and there's all that. And I actually have to pay my own my own utility now. And so what we did is we have a site where if you go in there, you can put in the one dollar amount that you think you can manage for the month, and we'll figure out houses that fit in that. And so it's not only do you speak on the language, you do you speak the language of the current population. But we're also learning the importance of imagery. And this is something that I think is real in our business. When you think of how important images, we heard it from our panel today. And here's a couple of interesting numbers. 80 million. 80 million Instagram photos and 3 billion Snapchats are uploaded and shared per day. That's a daily take of images. In fact, it seemed that they're looking at the, the numbers, about 10% of every image ever taken in the history of the world was taken in the last 12 months. And a good chunk of them by us and our kids. And so we take a look at images, and so we look at Zillow. And we said, okay, what houses actually get the most views? And we said, the image, the photos that, uh, houses that have images between 25 and 50, and especially true if they have high quality images, actually get 50% more views than those that only have 10. So images will actually drive a consumer's connection with a property, actually drive them to connect with that property more. And in fact, if we take a look at the listings that sold above this price and we factor out all of the other pieces of data, over almost half of them had professional photography, and a good chunk of them had other bits of media, like a drone footage or surround footage or walkthrough footage. It actually impacts how much a consumer's connected with the property will actually drive their behavior of buying, that they're willing to pay more for properties that they have a deeper investment with, where they are in that online experience. And so we said, okay, how can technology help? And so there's a little company out of Atlanta, and so we bought it a few years ago, about two years ago. Because what this company does is it deals in media. It knows how to sit alongside of an MLS and actually handle some of the data that is difficult for MLSs to handle. And one of the things that we saw that was difficult for some MLSs to handle was if their broker was in two different MLSs. How does the data go between the two systems? And so we actually just launched this live in Atlanta. And Atlanta has an interesting issue in that they have two large MLSs that overlap almost 80%. 
And so every broker and every agent has to sit down and enter it as one MLS, then sit down and enter it in the second MLS. And then if you're a member of a franchise, if your broker has a back office system, uh, or if you want to get paid, you have to go to your broker system and enter it a third time. So we said software can fix that. And so we have one input screen that knows the business rules of all the entities. It doesn't store the data. It pushes it automatically into three different systems if you're the Sutherland's broker. It pushes it into Georgia MLS, into First MLS, and it pushes it into your Realty back office system. Now that's the data part. What about the photos? So photos are interesting because you know, here, of course, you're going to take a lot of high-res photos. You have professional photographers. You have such beautiful images. So you have a photographer take the images. How do they get them to you? If they email them to you, they automatically have to reduce the size of them to get them through most email programs. Or they drop them in Dropbox, and then you're trying to figure out how to get into Dropbox and pull those photos out. We said there has to be a better way. So our system will take unlimited photos at unlimited resolution. It would be 4K video, it could be a PDF, it doesn't matter. It's anything that has to do with images. If you have that professional photographer, we allow you to invite the photographer into the listing. And so now the photographer uploads it directly into the repository of the listing. Then you as the listing agent simply go and choose the ones you want tax them to the listing, we automatically put them into the MLS at the resolution of the MLS, but we store the high resolution photos for you as a broker or agent to use in the rest of your marketing. You never have to touch it. Your photographer has already got it, have them stick it into the repository for you to grab. So how does this work? So it goes into our system, and if the MLS can take 36 photos, we put 36 photos into the MLS, but if you had 50 photos, we put them around that we stored into a database that the MLS has access to, and then you as a broker can partition that out and send it to your various vendors wherever you want it to go. Don't lose quality. Don't lose sophistication of your data. We simply just come alongside and put a marketing stack on top of the MLS stack for to use. We also, of course, fully designed for mobile, so you can arrange your photos on mobile, you can take a new picture, you can change the price of your house, you can take it off status, all as you're driving down the 405, or in your case, sitting on the 405, because apparently nobody actually drives on your highways. And this is being used. We have over 9,000 agents who have access to this in the Atlanta area. We have hundreds of listings being uploaded every week throughout this system for that. We're launching it, it's live in Atlanta. We're doing Rhode Island. It's coming to your MLS. We're actually working with Andy and the team to do this. So for those of you who handle multiple systems, those of you who handle high resolution photos, we're actually coming to sit alongside this MLS and provide that technology that we have. Now, that's one side. That's putting data in. How do you get data out? So for those of you who are brokers or agents and you have data sitting in multiple MLSs, then you have multiple agreements and multiple data feeds that you have to pull in. So we actually solved that issue as well. And so we have an API, this fancy word for a bunch of code, that takes the data out of multiple MLSs and it standardizes it. Now, what does it standardize it to? It standardizes it, standardizes it to the Real Estate Standards Organization, RESO's specification. And so if you're a broker, you can attach to three or four different data sources to pull data down from the system all in exactly the same format. And we were awarded the Rezo certification platinum status. We're the first and only one. In fact, the Rezo board and the Rezo work group is actually meeting at the Solo headquarters today because it's close to Microsoft and they're actually working directly with Microsoft to help flush out some of those standards. This stuff is real and it's good for the industry. So what else? So a couple of things we're playing around with. So this one here is a test in Phoenix. So how many of you do walkthrough videos of your house? So you have, a, there's expensive cameras, very sort of expensive equipment to do that. We thought, I wonder if you can use computer intelligence to do that with your iPhone. And so we're doing a test where you simply, as an agent, walk into a, a house and you do five or six panoramic shots. We upload those, and our computers stitch those together into a 3D walkthrough of the house. You can do it all from your iPhone right now. Samsung is coming next. It requires no expensive equipment. Just simply requires you to take a few surround or panoramic videos of your house, and you're automatically set with the walkthroughs. Is it going to work? Yeah, I think so. We're testing it out right now. If it works, we'll roll it out to the rest of the country. We're using AI. 
So we're actually uh, investors in a company called Hutch. And Hutch app allows you to bring up a photo of a house, a room specifically, and populate it with various pieces of furniture. So if you want to see what that room would look like with furniture, they have a whole portfolio of furniture, and you can paint the room, you can put rugs down, you can put uh, uh, furniture in the room to see whether or not this matches your style, this matches what you look like. So you can take that listing and you can dress it up the way that you want to do it. So NASA. NASA has deep and rich data on topography. In other words, where is hand, uh, land high and where is it low? But most of the maps that we use in real estate do not, does not have topography. It's sort of a flat map that's got the data on it. So we said, what if we can merge those two? And this is only in the labs. We haven't shipped anything around this. But if we can figure out how high something is compared to what's next door, we can probably tell if it has a view. If it's high enough to actually see over the house next door, because we know if one house is two-story, next is a three. And so our idea is here, is if, if we aren't, don't have information on the view yet, because someone's taking a picture of that, do we actually determine it because we actually know the exact elevation of every single house in the country? Because NASA knows because they've had shot images of every piece of land in the United States. And of course, we feed this data into our assessment, trying to figure out whether a house is worth more or worth less for that. But all of a sudden, this data is now becoming available. We're also teaching our assessment to read images. And so if the agent has to put in, whether that's granite countertop or that stainless steel appliances, uh, look at the computer looks at the images and determines what it is, it can actually adjust that house accordingly as far as its value. Now, this is freaking some people out. So there's an interesting study. This was done by a company that makes pasta. Pasta, you know, the thing that you cook for me. Uh, for those of you who cook, I mean. Um, and so they, yes, and you just grab uh, So they sent out a survey to all their customers and said, how can we make your dinner time more, more uh, better? You know, how can we make it more pleasant experience? And they really expected people to send back notes saying, better recipes, easier stuff. You know what they, you know, they heard back? How do you get people to stop fighting at the dinner table? Because everybody walks to the dinner table with their phone, and they just read the last, last tweet out to buy somebody, uh, or they have read some piece of information, and then there's arguments about information. No one asks each other about each other's lives. They ask about people's lives who aren't there because they're connected by their phones the whole time. They said, if you can stop the technology-driven arguments at the dinner table, you'll make our life great. And so this company raised some money, and they're in the process of making a pepper shaker. Now, it's a real pepper shaker. If you twist it, it will spit out pepper. But it also has a sophisticated cell phone and Wi-Fi blocker in it. So you set that thing in the middle of your table, and no device works. <laughs> so if you're on an MLS committee, and you show up for your committee meeting, and you wonder why there's a pepper shaker in the middle of the table, that's why. <laughs> the technology is shaping this, these experiences. People want to be able to do things at the right time when they're ready for it. They want to be able to do it at the right place, which is usually mobile. It's not sitting down to a recorded computer. But they also want to find the right property. And this is where we can use this intelligence to begin to help people to expand their search experience before they've reached out to a professional. So we are looking at search patterns. And we see a whole bunch of people want to live, this happens to be in Seattle, in the Magnolia area of Seattle, because that's the prime area to live if you work at Amazon. And we notice that actually, yes, about 30 miles south, but equal distance from the middle of the city to the south is an area that is geographically very similar, has the same sort of feel, it has the same amount of restaurants in it, but it doesn't have the same price, it has a lot more inventory. We're going to see these issues as inventories continue to collapse. And so can the system actually begin to say, you may want to look over here, it's not geographically similar, but it is as far as the native feel of the place and, and the location to work and the commute times, etc. How about other information? So we were looking at some data about LA. And if you take the LA market and you split it into three segments, you have the bottom one third price-wise, the middle third, and the top third. The question is, which was the best buying experience? From a, from a revenue, for, from an income standpoint, if you're going to make money on a property, were you better off buying in the lower one third or the top one third? 
For those of you who work in Harvard, you probably know this intuitively, but it's the bottom one third. The bottom one third of the last year has had a 9% increase, but if you look over the last five years, it's a 66% increase in value. The top one third of the market, because it's LA, that's uh, over well over a million, has had an 8% increase in the last year. That's not bad, but it significantly trails the bottom when it comes to a five year trending for that. So this is the type of data that you can actually put into your business and actually decide to, to, to pass on to your clients. And the clients that you touch with, they touch base with, they expect you to use this. They expect you to have technology. In fact, people survey said, the business, the companies I do business with, I expect them to be as knowledgeable about the equipment and technology as I am. In fact, it's the checkout experience. That word checkout experience, what's the, what's the checkout experience in real estate? It's the closing table, right? I will walk away from a site, they said, and they make the checkout experience too difficult. Think about how the millions of dollars Amazon has put into getting you to check that box and getting that package delivered to you as seamless as possible because they know that's where most of the breakage is. That's where people get stalled out. That's where they walk away from a site. So what does this all mean? We take a look at technology as driving consumer behaviors. They're absolutely doing that. And these changes are happening, and they're happening perfectly. The consumer is not going to go back. The consumer is only going to start uh, to keep going forward from this point out. But we believe that these changes are being driven by technology, that this technology can work both sides. It can work the consumer, and it can work on the servicer side. <coughs> We believe that there's technology that helps you meet that consumer where they are. I have heard at how many conferences that, you know, the Uberization, I guess I hate that word, Uberization of real estate. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I believe that there's going to be agents at that transaction. There are going to be agents at that closing table from here to, to the future. But the agents that are going to be there are ones that make that experience like the experiences we have the rest of our life. As seamless, and as clean, and as painless, and will people pay for it? We talk about the commissions being pressed down. Well, if you're willing to pay 25% more for online groceries because they're delivered to your store, your, to your house, in an experience that you love, if you can provide an experience that people love, they will pay for it. And so we are partnering with agents and with MLSs, with our technology and the spend that we have, because we are committed as a company to keeping agents in the transaction, because our business is a dating service between a consumer who has expectations on one side and an agent who has the ability to fulfill those needs on the other side. 